Heavenly Father, as we take up the consideration of the spirit of prophecy, we ask that you would guide direct in our conversation. Let what we share be for your glory and honor. And let this presentation be one that uh, would help edify your people and confirm this wonderful gift that you've given to your church at this point in earth's history. In Jesus' name, amen. There, there is a study that we've done. It's the first study that we actually did publicly. Um, I don't know how, it's over a decade ago. It was called the Prophetic Pattern. It still is called the Prophetic Pattern. And uh, it's where we were talking about the 3-1 combination earlier. It is where, it's the study where we go through and we look very closely at the 3-1 combination. And the 3-1 combination is representing the three angels' messages that came into history in 1840 through 44. First angel's message came into history August 11th, 1840. The second angel's message came into history on Ju in June of 1842. And the third angel's message came into history on October 22nd, 1844. We're now waiting for the fourth angel's message. Uh, so that period of time between the third angel's message and the fourth gives you a combination, 3-1 combination. And when you go pull together the different passages in the Bible where you see this 3-1 combination illustrated, God isn't redundant. He's, it's not just, he puts it in there, he puts it in there, and it doesn't mean anything. When you pull them together, you begin to develop a picture of Adventism, because that's what it's about. It's about the Millerite movement and the time period of the 144,000. And one of the most serious truths that you develop out of this, that I, that I think serious, who knows what the Lord thinks is most serious, but it's very clear uh, in the spirit of prophecy that the first, second, and third angel's message in the Millerite time period were three tests. And if you didn't pass that first test, if you didn't accept the preaching of William Miller, then you weren't even involved with the second test. Now, if you did ex accept the message of the Millerites, and you came to the point in time when the organized denominational churches closed their doors on the Millerites, and that kind of peer pressure scared you out of the message, then you just flunked the second test. And you weren't, in, you weren't there for the third test. And the third test was when the door was closed. And all this, all this history... You bring all the different lines of prophecy that describe this history together and you realize that it's at the third test where the door is closed. And once you, once you develop the characteristics of these three tests, you find that the first test is a reform message. Sister White associates William Miller with the first angel's message and she compares William Miller with John the Baptist. And when she talks about the time period of Jesus, she says there was three tests in the time period of Jesus and John the Baptist brought the first test and she compares both William Miller and John the Baptist with Elijah. When you bring this 3-1 combination together in this prophetic pattern, which is an 11-hour presentation that I'm going to summarize here in about five minutes, you find that that first test has to do with a reform message. William Miller was a reformer in the Millerite time period. Second test is a visual test. And by that I mean there is something going around, on around you that you must see if you were going to be prepared for the third test. And the third test is where the door closes. And in Bible prophecy, the first place that we find the illustration of the closing of the door is the close of probation is where? Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark is a symbol of it's the third test because it's at the third test in inspiration where the door closes. So when you look at the three angels' messages in Willie Miller's time period, in the Millerite time period, the first test is a reform message. The second test is a visual test. You need to see something going on. And the third test is where the door closes. And sure enough, when you go back to Noah, the door closed. So I ask you a question. When the animals were getting on the ark, was probation still open? Yes, they had a visual test, a visual warning saying, hey, what you see happening right now, that's telling you, if you have the spiritual discernment to see, and I don't think any of them did, I'm not saying that, but if you have the spiritual discernment to see, you can tell that God is going to bring this message of Noah to pass. And sure enough, he closed the door. So as you go, that, that's not the only ones. There are several places this is illustrated. Um, the second test in the days of William Miller was when the denominational churches closed their door to the Millerites. And they didn't just close their door to the Millerites. They began taking out newspaper ads when they were in town, telling people why they were wrong. It was a, something that was going on in the community that everyone would see. It was, a, it was visual. You could see it. You could tell there was some kind of response you had to make. You had to make a decision about that. If you left the Millerite movement, then 
you weren't involved with the experience when the door closed. So there's a lot of, lot of development of those positions, but when, where, where the rubber meets the road on that study is when you emphasize correctly and soundly that the Millerite time period is repeated again to the very letter, and at the end of the world there are three tests for Seventh-day Adventists, and it's at the Sunday Law where the door closes on Seventh-day Adventists. Therefore, there are two tests before the Sunday Law for Seventh-day Adventists, and if we flunk the first test, we're not involved with the second test. We flunk the second test, we're not involved with the third test. And in the question and answer period a minute ago, I, I gave a quote from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 966, Volume 7, we'll leave it at that, that there's a test before probation closes, before we're sealed, by which our eternal destiny is decided, and it has to do with the image of the beast. It's a visual test. Seventh-day Adventists, we need to recognize that church and state are coming together in the United States because as we see them coming together, as we see the Christian right hijacking the Congress of the United States, we know that the Sunday Law is coming. And we know, therefore, that we better prepare a character for the seal of God because when the Sunday Law arrives, we will demonstrate whether we have a character prepared for the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And no time, then, to, to develop character. Sister White says character is never developed in a crisis that's only demonstrated. So the visual warning for us, the animals are getting on the ark, based on the fact that church and state are coming together in the United States. But at the end of the world, our first test is the same as the first test always is. What was the first test during the days of the ark? The message of Noah, a reformer. Sister White says in Select the Messages, Book 3, page 84, One thing is certain, those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner, where do we take our stand under Satan's banner? At the Sunday Law. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. Our first test is the spirit of prophecy. It, Sister White says in Desire of Ages 799, It is the voice of Christ that speaks through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam to the, even to the closing scenes of time. If it was the voice of Christ speaking in the days of Adam, whose voice was it speaking in the ministry of Ellen White? the voice of Christ to the closing scenes of time. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 661. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, He speaks to them by the testimonies of His Spirit. There was never a time when God instructed His people more earnestly than He instructs them now concerning His will and the course He would have them pursue. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he does now through the spirit of prophecy. That's a different approach than we hear in Adventism many times. So, there is a way to show the role of Sister White that's kind of interesting and it's kind of easy. I mean, it's, and you, and this isn't a complex study to follow. You'll like it. Usually Adventists like this. There are many types of prophets in the Bible. You know, there's prophets that are mentioned in the Bible that never wrote anything. You just, you, you heard a name mentioned. There's women prophets, there's men prophets, uh, there are prophets that, that wrote things in the Bible, but there are certain prophets that are, have a connection to time prophecies in the Bible, time prophecies that have a relationship with God's people. And there's time prophecy in the Bible, the 1260 years of papal rule isn't specifically about God's people, it's got a connection to it, but the time prophecies we're talking about are the time prophecies like the 2300 years or the the time period that Israel spent in Egypt, the ones that are directly connected with God's people have internal rules within those prophecies that always manifest themselves. And the internal rules we'll lay out for you. And the um, Bible rule is, upon the testimony of how many is the thing established? Two or three. If we see these internal rules two or three times, then we can be certain that every time we look at a similar manifestation of this time prophecy, that we should expect the same things to happen. So what we're looking at is time prophecies that have a connection with God's people. And here's what we will expect to see. In a time prophecy, this is the, the, the line of time. You always have a prophet at the beginning that we call a proclaiming prophet. And they are the ones that proclaim the prophecy. At, when the time prophecy is fulfilled, we, ha we find what we call a gathering prophet. And the reason we call them a gathering prophet is because there is al always a remnant of people 
that gather around, not necessarily the prophet, but the message. This time prophecy always has a present truth message when it comes into history. And the prophet that's raised up is a prophet that has a ministry directly connected to that present truth message. And there's a, a remnant of people that recognize that message of that time prophecy as present truth unto themselves. It's always, it's always the case. Always the case. One other thing, when it comes to a gathering prophet, their ministry is always life or death. Always. Now, there, there's one other thing. When it comes to these proclaiming and gathering prophets, their name, either one, corresponds to their ministry. You'll see what we mean by that in a moment. It's easy to see. The first time prophecy in the Bible, um, though not as specifically set forth as some, is the 120 years that the, the Spirit would speak to the world before the flood. Um, and who was the prophet that proclaimed that 120 years? His name was Enoch. He was the proclaiming prophet. And what does, what does his name, what does Enoch mean? It means teacher. And uh, in Upward Look, page 228, Sister White says this, Enoch was a public teacher of truth in the age in which he lived. See, his name meant teacher, and that's what he was. His name corresponded to his ministry. And if you look closely at the Bible, you'll find how Enoch proclaimed this 120 years before the flood would come. How did he do that? Through his son, and his son's name was Methuselah, which means when he dies, it shall come. And if you're very careful to the genealogy of Methuselah life, you'll find that the very year that he died is when the flood comes. Now, brothers and sisters, Noah being the gathering prophet during this time period, his name means comfort, and Genesis says that Noah was to comfort his people. So his name corresponded to his, to his ministry, but Noah understood this time prophecy. Wouldn't we think that Noah understood the 120-year time prophecy? He's the one that's proclaiming the message. So imagine what happened the year that Methuselah died. No doubt, Noah probably was the one that gave the funeral for Methuselah, right? Can you imagine that funeral? Oh, man, the flood's coming, he's dead, it's about to happen. So, but in any case, was there a remnant of people that recognized the flood as present truth that were raised up to help Noah build the ark? There were many, not just his family. Through the years, other people helped. Some were laid to rest, some turned away. But there was a remnant of people raised up that believed the message of the coming flood was present truth. Let me ask you a question. Noah's message, was it life or death? If you didn't accept it, death. If you did, life. That's one. That's one. Next time prophecy in the Bible was Abram had a time prophecy in how long the children of Israel were going to go down into Egypt. And I said Abram on purpose because when he proclaimed that prophecy, his name was Abram. And uh, Abram means the father is exalted. And if you go in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, you find that during the, the time period of Abram's life, when he was called Abram, that his custom was, wherever he moved to, he was going to stay there, he built an altar, and the people in that area came to know who his God was based upon his lifestyle. And his name was, the Father was exalted, and during that time period, that is what he did, is he exalted his heavenly Father. His name corresponded to his ministry. Later, his name becomes what? Abraham, which means what? The father of many nations, he's the father of the Jews, he's the father of um, Islam, the father of Christianity. His name corresponds to his ministry, all right? And he, he talked about 430 years um, before, while the children of Israel would be in, in Egypt, and then they would come out. And so we can expect at the end of that time prophecy that the Lord is going to raise up a gathering prophet. And who's the prophet that was raised up? when it's time to come out of Egypt. Moses. And what's, what's Moses' name mean? Saved out of the water. And as a little boy, Moses was saved, as a baby, not a little boy, Moses is saved out of the water. And the Lord used Moses to save his people through the waters of the Red Sea. And had Moses not struck the rock, the Lord would have used Moses to bring his people into the promised land through the waters of the Jordan. 
His name corresponded to his ministry, right? Now, what happened to the people that did not accept Moses' ministry? They all died in the wilderness, right? Moses' ministry, life or death. You see the, you see the, the scenario that we're trying to set up here. You see the, the characteristics of a time prophecy that deals with God's people is always the same. That's two. That's two. Um, you know, there's a two. I won't go there. <laughs> I won't go there. The next time prophecy dealing with God's people is given by Jeremiah telling how long God's people were going to go into captivity in Babylon. And how long were they going to go into captivity? Seventy years. What does Jeremiah mean? It means two things. Yahweh is exalted and Yahweh strikes. You read the book of Jeremiah. Read Lamentations. Jeremiah was giving a warning message that was exalting God, but warning the people that God was about to strike them in judgment. His name corresponded to his ministry. And there is one prophet in the Bible that is identified as understanding the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Who is that? Daniel. And Daniel chapter 9, he acknowledges that he's been studying the Bible, and from the book of Jeremiah, he realizes that it's time for God's people to come out of Babylon. And what does Daniel mean? God is my judge. And I mean, how many different types of judgment are in the story of Daniel? If the first verse begins with Babylon bringing judgment against Jerusalem, we have the investigative judgment in Daniel 8.14, we see Belshazzar's kingdom being judged, we see Nebuchadnezzar being judged with seven times passing over him. There's so many judgments in the book of Daniel. His name corresponds with his ministry. He was the gathering prophet for the time period when the children of Israel were to come out of Babylon and rebuild Jerusalem. But, but uh, in Patriarchs and Prophets... When, I mean, Prophets and Kings, when Sister White's talking about the third decree to come out of Babylon, and she's talking about Ezra, she says, when Ezra seen how few people came out of Babylon, he says the number was disappointingly small. That's what she says. And very few people came out of Babylon. None compared to what should have came out. What happened to those majority of Israelites that stayed in Babylon? They walk with God's people no more. The message was life or death. Always the same. It's always the same. Now, um, the difference with Daniel is that he's both a gathering prophet and he's a proclaiming prophet. And if you would get an audio or a videotape that, that we've done this presentation a year or so ago, or even probably six months ago, although I don't think we did it recently, at this point I'd say, Daniel proclaimed the longest time prophecy in the Bible. But did Daniel proclaim the longest time prophecy in the Bible? No, the 2520. But he did proclaim the 2300 year time prophecy. that begins in 457, right? And it talks about seven weeks. The streets and walls would be rebuilt. And then um, there are three prophecies in the week when Christ was confirming the covenant with many for one week, uh, when Christ would be anointed, the cross, when he'd be cut off in the midst, and when the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles, and then, of course, we have 1844. We will find that this pattern is upheld in every one of these prophecies. Every one of them. Um, Uh, the first time prophecy goes to the, to the time period when Jerusalem was going to be rebuilt, and there are two prophets that are raised up in that time period, Haggai and Zechariah. Haggai means one born on a feast day. And if you read Haggai's testimony, his emphasis during that time period is that it is time to do the work of rebuilding the streets and the walls and the temple. His emphasis was always about its time. And f the feast days are symbolic of prophetic time. The, the feast days of the Old Testament are prophetic symbols of the whole gospel dispensation. So when Haggai's name is one born on a feast day, it's a name that is corresponding to his ministry because he was there telling the people it's time to finish the work of the Lord. His name corresponded to his ministry. And Zechariah means Yahweh has remembered. And over and over you'll see Zechariah say, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me for the work that I've done. And if you look at that closely... What he's representing is people that have taken up the work of the Lord that wish to be remembered in the judgment. 
in a good way. He's, he's representing people that did the work of the Lord and they want to be remembered in a righteous way in the judgment. And what would happen to the people that were doing, what happened to the people that were doing the work of rebuilding Jerusalem and the walls and the streets if they refused the reforms that were brought about by Haggai and Zechariah and Nehemiah? Well, one of them, the, those that refused to turn loose of their Babylonian wives, what happened to them? They were sent out to no longer walk with God's people. And the other part of the reform was uh, that they were selling at the gates on Sabbath. They were sent away. All the reforms that are identified in the, the rebuilding time period were life and death. Were life and death. Haggai and Zechariah's ministry were life and death. Their name corresponded to their ministries. You see in the pattern? Are, is everyone with me on this? You're seeing the pattern. And I realize it's the end of the day. But we're going to have some questions here. You, I, and I, unfortunately, you have already received the handouts. We can't do the questions. We'll just have to go through it. There is a prophet raised up when it's time for Christ to be baptized. And who is this prophet? John the Baptist. Do we know him as John or do we know him as John the Baptist? John the Baptist. John means Yahweh is gracious. But we know him as John the Baptist because his work was to baptize Christ. By the way, I've been leaving something out. Was there, was there a remnant of people that understood there was a work to do in rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem? Yes. Don't let me leave out the remnant. When it came time to baptize Christ, was there a remnant of people that believed in that ministry? Who were they? The disciples of John the Baptist were there baptizing with him, right? There was a remnant. In early writings, page 259, which we've mentioned here before, Sister White has a statement when she's talking about the history of Christ, which she then compares with the history of the Millerites, she says, those that would not receive the ministry of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. What does it mean if you can't be benefited by the teachings of Jesus? You're lost. John the Baptist's ministry was life or death. Right? It's always the same. There was a remnant. His name corresponded to his ministry, and he was a gathering prophet, and his ministry was life or death. Now, if you wouldn't have had the handouts, this is usually a good trick question. You ask the brethren at this point, what gathering prophet was raised up at the cross? And everyone's unsure, but brothers and sisters, there's only one disciple that went all the way to the cross, and it was John the Revelator. And when you look at John the Revelator's ministry, not only do we call him John the Revelator because of the book of Revelation, but whether it's the Gospel of John, or 1 John, or 2 John, or 3 John, or the book of Revelation, you always see John portraying his prophetic testimony in the terms, I'm telling you about the one that I've handled, I've touched, I've heard, I've lived with, and he is trying to emphasize that he knew Jesus Christ and he's trying to reveal him to the world. His name corresponds to his ministry. And uh, it's not just in the book of Revelation. You see on the pot, no, you don't have these notes. 1 John 1, 1 through 3 says, That which was from the beginning, this is John, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was, in, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The ministry of John was the ministry of revealing Christ. John the Revelator, his name corresponds to his ministry. And he's raised up as a gathering prophet at the, cro prophet at the cross. Is the message of the cross life or death? It's always the same. It's always the same. Then the next time prophecy in the 2300 years is that Israel's going to be divorced of God, and there's always a very good trick question here. Who's the prophet raised up at this time prophecy? Is that Paul? That's usually the answer, and it's not correct. The Saul is his name. And what does Saul mean? It means selected or set forth. And Paul, that's what the Bible says about uh, Paul in... Um, Acts 9.15 of Saul, it says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. Saul had been a chosen vessel 
even in his rebellion against God. His name was Saul, which means selected or set forth. And Acts says he's a chosen vessel. But his name was then changed to Paul. And what does that mean? Poquito, little. And that's how Paul expresses about who he is in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 8, 9, he says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles. The strength of Paul's ministry is that he knew full well is that he was the smallest, the littlest of them all. He was Paul because he had persecuted the church of God. His name corresponded to his ministry. Was there a group of people that understand that the remnant was there a remnant of people raised up at the cross that believed the message of John the Revelator that was to be carried to the world? Yes. Was there a remnant raised up during the time period of the Apostle Paul that believed it was time to carry the gospel to the world? Yes. Was the gospel to the Gentiles a life or death question? Absolutely. So where is this leading? This is leading to 1844. Upon the testimony of two or three, things should be established, Correct. So in 1844, at the conclusion of this time prophecy, what should we expect to see? We should expect to see a gathering prophet whose ministry corresponds to the message of this time prophecy. And this message is unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We should expect to see a remnant of people raised up that understand this message of present truth. And this gathering prophet, different than all the other gathering prophets, this gathering prophet's ministry is optional. Right? It's life or death. Correct? Life or death. So, let's look at this ministry. And of course, you've got the notes in front of you. Ellen White is the prophet to Laodicea. And brothers and sisters, we are Laodiceans. And in the message to Laodicea, in Revelation 3.18, Laodiceans are counseled to get three things, right? Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with salve, that thou mayest see. Three things. Gold, white raiment, and ISAP. ISAP. Let me erase some of this. ISAP. Sometimes a trick question for Adventists, or for anyone, I suppose. But ISAP is spiritual discernment. We understand that much. But if you ask an audience in, in the Bible, in, in spiritual things, what is spiritual discernment? Pardon me? Light, but that, that's not the answer I'm after. What, what is spiritual discernment? Usually the answer is the Holy Spirit. Right? Everyone say amen to that? See, that's not correct. Because the Bible says you have to test the Spirit. Spiritual discernment is the Word of God. And I mean, there's, there's statements where Sister White's very clear on that. If you haven't thought through, I mean, you, we're not going to understand the Bible correctly without the presence of the Holy Spirit, you know, touching our discernment. But the foundation of spiritual discernment is the Bible. All right? And the Bible says of itself that it is a bright and shining light. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, The Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, Spiritual discernment, when the Laodiceans need spiritual discernment, they need the Bible, and one of the things that symbolizes the Bible is that it's a lamp unto thy feet. So it isn't an accident that the word Ellen means a bright and shining light. You know, I don't know if it's really important to tell this part of the story, but I'm a, I tell it usually. When I came across this study for myself years ago, we were still living in California, so this is, I don't know, 15 years ago. I knew, 
I knew based on just the logic of this presentation that Sister White was the gathering prophet and her ministry is life or death and her name needed to correspond to her ministry and therefore I knew that somehow, some way, Ellen Gold White had to say something about her ministry. And I had a guess on what it was. I had a guess that she was the prophet to Laodicea and I needed to prove it. And for a couple years there, Every time my wife wanted to go to a shopping mall, I was willing to go with her, and I really don't like to go to shopping malls, but the reason I was willing to go is they always have these bookstores in the shopping malls, and you can go get the books that have the baby's names that give you the definitions of the baby's name, and I needed to find what the definition of Gould was, and it's not there. And then we moved to Washington State, and uh, close to Seattle, about an hour and a half from Seattle, and one day, the first time, once we were in Washington State, that we were going to go in and just check out the city of Seattle, as we're driving down the street in Seattle, I says, you know, they're, they're bound to have a big public library in Seattle. And as soon as I said that, we drove up and here we are at the Seattle Public Library and it is big. So we parked the car and we went in there and we walked in the door and there's a, a man there and I, I says, do you have any books on people's names? And he says, follow me. And he took me over to the section of the library and there was a book there that was really about this thick of names. He says, this is the best, but we have several. And as he was leaving to let us look through it, he opened it, and it opened right up to Gould. You know what Gould means? It's an old English word, meaning gold. What do you suppose white means? White, brothers and sisters, is white. <laughs> Ellen White is the prophet to Laodicea. To reject the ministry of Ellen White is life or death, and to reject the ministry of the spirit of prophecy is to reject the remedy to Laodicea. The eye salve that we need is a bright and shining light. That's Ellen. The faith which works by love and purifies our soul that is symbolized by gold, that's gold. The righteousness of Christ, which is the white raiment, that's white. But you know what else? Before Sister White was Ellen Gould White, what was she? And what do you suppose Harmon means? Of course, you already have it in your notes. Usually the answer to that, if you don't have notes, this is a fun presentation because you can ask questions through it and if the people don't have the notes, they don't know the answer and you get a little bit of interaction in it. Usually you think harmony. But Harmon's close to that, but it's not harmony. Harmon means a Christian soldier. So what do you have here, brothers and sisters? Here you have the characteristics not of Laodicea, but of Philadelphia. Because the Philadelphians were soldiers for the Lord, taking the message to the world. They were acting on faith, symbolized by gold, and they were following the Word of God, the Bible, the bright and shining light. Ellen White was the prophet to the Philadelphians and the Laodiceans. Now, brothers and sisters, earlier we talked about a connecting link prophet a couple days ago. Some of you weren't here. But if you, I don't know what you have on your notes, but I'll read this to you. Cole Porter Ministry, page 125-126. The Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to a greater light. Oh, how much good would be accomplished if the books containing this light were read with the determination to carry out the principles they contain. There would be a thousandfold greater vigilance, a thousandfold more self-denial and resolute effort, and many more would now be rejoicing in the light of present truth. Brothers and sisters, in Adventism today, you'll hear people say that Sister White was the lesser light, but it's light. All the prophets, every prophet was the lesser light in comparison to Christ, who was the greater light, but they were all light. To reject light is to reject Christ. So the, the comparison of lesser light, greater light, has nothing to do with putting Sister White down in the level of some type of minor prophet. We're going to be held accountable for the light that we receive or reject. Notice this. Here's a, another quote about lesser light. The de Desire of Ages, page 220. Uh, 
The prophet John was the connecting link between two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law and the prophets to the Christian dispensation. He was the lesser light. John the Baptist was a lesser light. But also it says in here that he was a connecting link between two dispensations. What does that mean? John the Baptist was a connecting link prophet, if you can call him that. I'm taking it from this statement. John the Baptist was used to direct the focus of worship of God's per people from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. What was the first thing that John the Baptist stated when he seen Christ? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The very first thing he did, the very first action he made, was to begin his work as a connecting league prophet, pointing the people from the, to the end of the earthly sanctuary dispensation and lifting their thoughts to the beginning of the heavenly sanctuary dispensation. John the Baptist was a connecting link prophet, a dispensational prophet, however you want to call him, John the Baptist. There's another connecting link prophet. His name's Noah. The worship of God's people before the flood took place at the gates of the Garden of Eden. Inspiration's clear about that. And the first thing that Noah did after he got off the ark was what? Build an altar. Noah was a connecting link prophet. He was used to change the focus of worship from the gates of the Garden of Eden to altar worship. So we'll put Noah up there. This is John the Baptist. This is Noah. The other connecting link prophet is Moses. Moses was used to change the focus of worship for God's people from altars to what? To the earthly sanctuary. There's only one other connecting link prophet in sacred history. And who is that? Ellen White was used by the Lord to change the focus of worship for God's people from the holy place to the most holy place. And particularly in her beginning writings, that's what she was consistently speaking about. She had a vision of Christ moving from the holy to the most holy. She had a, a vision of the sanctuary, of the ark, of the Ten Commandments. This was her work. But the brothers and sisters, stand back and think about this for a moment. In, Ad, in Adventism today, in the last general conference session, kind of buried away, and I'm not certain even what it means to this day, but there was a resolution passed that says we basically praised Ellen White for a page or so, and then it summarized the resolution this way. We're not to use the writings of Ellen White for faith and practice. What does that mean? What's faith and practice? I don't know what that resolution means, but it's alarming when we're told that the very last deception of Satan is to make of none effect the spirit of prophecy. But when we stand back from this, and we see things like that going on, and we hear about lesser lights and greater lights, and we say, you know what? If we're going to categorize Ellen White, who does she stand with? She stands with John the Baptist, Noah, and Moses. Can, can you pull together a grouping of three other prophets, John the Baptist, Moses, and Noah. Can you pull together three other prophets that you think might have more weight than those three? Ellen White stands with those three. And her ministry, because she's a gathering prophet, is life or death. And she, her ministry, the spirit of prophecy, is the first test for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world. And if we flunk the first test, we're not around for the second test. And brothers and sisters, we haven't taken any time to show it to you, but the second test has to do with the coming together of church and state in the United States. It's the image of the beast test. That's why when Sister White says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, that this is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test they must pass before they are sealed. She's speaking about a test before the Sunday law because probation closes, the door shuts at the Sunday law, and we are sealed at the Sunday law. Look at Testimonies, Volume 5, page 214 and onward. We receive the seal of God at the Sunday law. There's a test before the Sunday law by which our eternal destiny is decided. It has to do with the image of the beast, and there's only one definition of the image of the beast. Only one. Mrs. White 
articulates it different ways, but it's the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. In our test today that began in 1989 with the formation of the Christian Coalition as Seventh-day Adventists is to realize that the religious right in the United States has hijacked the political system in the United States and the final movements will be rapid ones and in the very near future they're going to push through a Sunday law. That's our test. You know, why is that our, why is that our test? Because the Seventh-day Adventists living at the end of the world, we should know if we look that when that Sunday law arrives, probation closes. Closes. This is, do you think that God, the Bible says, the Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it to, through his servants, the prophets. Do you think he would bring his final remnant people down to the time period when he was going to close up shop and the judgment upon them and not trying to forewarn them that it's about to take place? He does so by telling us that our last warning that he's closing up shop in the most holy place above is a test, a visual test, that church and state are coming together in the United States, and this is telling us we must finish the work of character development or we're going to be lost. But you know what? When you look at these three tests, they're of such a nature that if you don't pass the first test, you're not involved with the second test. If, if I rejected William Miller's message the first time I heard it, I didn't care that organized churches closed the door against him. I'm not involved with the second test. But if I follow on with William Miller, and then I, the peer pressure drives me away, then I flunk the second test. Now, brothers and sisters, the second test for Seventh-day Adventists is the fact that church and state are coming together. But if I'm like some in Adventism today that have taken the writings of Ellen White and thrown them away or refused to read them, I have cut off the information base that inspiration has supplied that most clearly reveals the actions of the Protestants and the Catholics and the politicians in the United States. You can see it in the Bible, but you can see it a thousand times more clearly in a book like The Great Controversy. And if I flunk the first test and I throw away The Great Controversy, I no longer have the information available to tell me what's going on. And what's going on is the animals are getting on the ark and the door's about to close. And the first test for Seventh-day Adventists is the ministry of Ellen White. It's life or death. She's a gathering prophet. She's not a minor prophet. She stands with Moses, Noah, and John the Baptist. And her name corresponds to her ministry. And therefore, once you understand that, when you read Revelation 3, verse 18, you realize right there in that verse is Ellen Gould White. Right there in the Bible. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, it's very solemn times indeed that we're living in. Very easy to see that the door on the ark is soon to be shut. That the music on the plain of Dura that Nebuchadnezzar's image is about to sound. And Lord, we need the character that was illustrated by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We need the character demonstrated by Noah. But the prophetic testimony is that we're Laodiceans. We think everything's all right when everything's all wrong. We ask that you'd give us the, the courage to set aside the idols, the sins that have been preventing you from coming in and abiding in us through your Holy Spirit that you might come in and awaken us to the work that we must begin in ourselves and the work that we must do for others. We thank you for the prophetic word that so simply and clearly identifies that we've reached a time period when there is no longer any time to be playing around with an Adventist lifestyle but that we must truly be your possession. And We ask that you would make this happen in our life so that those of us in this room, if we never meet again here on planet Earth, that we might meet together on the sea of glass on our way to eternity, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.